What's up, guys? It's time for another Q and A. It is March seventeenth, two thousand nineteen. Today, uh, this week was another topic specific. It did Q and A on post show or post fat loss phase. Since last week was on contest prep and fat loss, we'll do what to do after that. So, all the questions are kind of related there. We'll go ahead and jump into it. <clears throat> uh, on Facebook, post show guys on TRT, would you still recommend PCT or just go back to their TRT protocol? Well, uh, TRT is pretty much a permanent thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, you're just going to go back to TRT. A lot of people may use extra supplementation during the, you know, during the show or show or contest prep, obviously, but, uh, you know, beyond that, just drop back to TRT depending on, you know, what your goals are. Um, you're never going to PCT in that case, really. Uh, next one, how fast to bring calories back up? What macros to focus on? <clears throat> okay. So we did a really good episode on post-show or reverse dieting, I guess, if you want to call it that. And that's kind of an overused term, but I suggest talking or checking that out on the mind body broadcast. But just as a general rule of thumb, I just like to look at what's lowest and what's impacting the person most first and focus on that, you know, uh, heavily. So, you know, if, if food's really low and cardio is not that high, then maybe increase food a little bit more and worry about cardio secondary or vice versa. Um, or if they're, you know, if cardio is very high and food's very low at the same time, then, you know, work on both of them equally. If someone's very taxed, you know, adrenals are burnout. out. They're very stressed, things like that will get rid of the most stressful components first. So probably cardio and focus on food slightly less and, you know, but still, still raise it, but as a percentage slightly less. So that's kind of how I like to look at it. Um, you know, if you have a natural competitor too, you might want to get the fats up a little bit more if they're kind of lacking the essential fats they need for hormone production, you know, cholesterol, converting steroid hormones and things along those lines. So... That those would be some things to consider. Now, there are a whole plethora of different variables there, but like I said, I mean, really good rule of thumb is just try to focus on what's low to begin with, and you're, that's probably going to be your best bet. And then definitely go back and check out that episode. We go way deep on that topic and all kinds of different potential scenarios there. <clears throat> okay. What are your general recommendations for training after the contest? Uh, you know, again, it's just going to depend on how how taxed is the person. Um, you're going to have to take into consideration how burnout are they. You don't necessarily need to stop completely. Um, you know, you're in that kind of super compensation state. You can partition nutrients really well. So you might want to at least keep training in, just keep it submaximal so you're not getting, you know, you're not furthering that stress. Um, so, you know, pump work, all that jazz. And then once you start to feel better, start working to progress, more progressive overload, heavier loads, things like that. But at least this way you're taking advantage of that enhanced nutrient partitioning and you're still burning calories and things. And, and you might even train for a little bit post-show, um, and that pump work or whatever, and then want to take a week off, uh, a lot of people, you know, a lot of the time I don't want to throw that week off in there right off the bat simply because people are more prone to overeating and things like that. It's just kind of a recipe for fat gain and, and starting that whole vicious cycle. So I like to get back into something, but it's going to depend on, you know, how burnt out a person is. Okay, so what are your thoughts on blasting, blasting with insulin coming out of a show into off season? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people like to use growth hormone and insulin post-show as, as they lower their, their anabolics just because it's a way they can they can grow. They're very insulin sensitive. They super compensate. They can get that kind of blown up effect to put on a lot of good weight. But again, you are very insulin sensitive. So your ability, you know, you're not going to need that much insulin just because your sensitivity to it's going to be very high. So, you know, you won't really be able to use much unless you're just eating like a complete idiot and to raise blood glucose enough to require the insulin. But outside of that, I mean, you're not gonna, you're not really just gonna be able to use that much. So I'm not sure by the term blasting, you can't just throw in a ton and you're gonna go hypoglycemic, right? Unless you have enough glucose there. So, um, 
it is, it, it's definitely a good idea to let other things stabilize like lipid, kidney function, liver, um, you know, all the cardiovascular risks that you're at with the other PEDs and, and then utilize those two things. But at the same time, I mean, how much you can actually use is not going to, might not be as much as you think unless you just like quadruple your food. Okay. So next one, how long post-show do you typically get labs done? I'm sure there are a lot of variables from client to client, but you usually let things stabilize a bit and get them drawn. Um, one thing I'd look at too is budget. Like if someone's on a tight budget, I pretty much assume that they, they're going to be a little bit off or a lot off. Then we might wait six to eight weeks. That way they're not getting labs done two weeks post-show they're off. And then we're doing it again, eight weeks to double check, you know, if they have the budget, we'll check it. And then we can kind of expedite the recovery process. We know exactly what's off and we can recover that part quicker. But if not, then, you know, we'll just wait, we'll wait six to eight weeks or so. And then most people are pretty normal by then. And if they're not, we know what needs to be worked on, um, in terms of health markers, but that's a pretty good rule of thumb. <clears throat> All right. Can long-term TRT impact DHEA and, uh, pregnenolone levels? Is this something to be concerned with? Sadly, uh, pregnenolone, I hope I'm saying that right. Testing is not possible in Australia. Okay, so I'm going to call it preg for short. Um, so this is sort of complicated. Um, the short answer is probably not, but um, preg is going to be, is has the ability to convert into a lot of different hormones. Typically, it's used through a couple primary pathways, either to convert, either to manufacture DHEA or uh, progesterone. Now, DHEA also has the ability to convert into other hormones, you know, like testosterone, which will aromatize to, to the different estrogens. And so you have a lot of things going on there. Like if essentially if, if someone's deficient in these things and they take them, then you're going to have conversion. Your body's very good at converting them into what it needs, um, you know, what it needs in those hormone, in those areas. Uh, but if you're not deficient, they can actually cause some issues. Like a lot of people like, uh, DHEA, for example, is heavily produced in the adrenals and it kind of helps with neurohormone uh, production. So, I mean, if you're, if you're over consuming these things, you can have side effects. You could have typical side effects of over, you know, overproduction of neurohormones. So like anxiety, depression, mood issues, things like that. So you don't want to overconsume these things. If you can't check, you mentioned you can't check the preg. So maybe try to check DHEA if you can. Uh, so you at least get some idea of if you need it or not. Uh, the TRT isn't necessarily going to directly affect it. Probably not. But uh, if, if you are deficient in these things, they can, you know, they can certainly help with mood and sexual function and uh, sleep and things like that just because they... Uh, they do have the ability to convert into all these other hormones. I've definitely seen people with like adrenal issues have low DHEA, obviously, you know, considering where it comes from, uh, you know, if they have hypoadrenal function, they may have low DHEA. Um, people using preg for increasing progesterone naturally, like if they have adrenal issues, you know, because of the conversion there, uh, or, you know, the, all the different mood issues that might go along with that adrenal fatigue state. So, there are definitely applications for those things and you can get DHEA and preg over the counter, at least here in the U S you can, I'm not sure about, uh, Australia, but they definitely have use. I just would be cautious in using them if you're not deficient. So maybe try to get the DHEA checked at least and see where that's at. But they, I mean, they, they do really great things if you're deficient and that's, it's kind of a hidden thing because a lot of people never check these and they don't know and they might be deficient and then so they're lacking conversions into these other hormones or there's some kind of issue with the cholesterol and steroid formation. I mean, so there's, it is, they do great things. It's just that I wouldn't consume them unless you actually need them, uh, which sounds like that's the tricky part. Maybe just try to check DHEA and see if you can figure anything out there and then uh, you'll know more. But that's it, guys. I kind of flew through them this week, only about 10 minutes. But uh, good Q&A, and I'll talk to you guys next week.